Thank yeah. You. Yeah, that's you know, great, right? Luis. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Hi, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is the fifth virtual creative workshop and variety show. Um, we're going to ask some of you who have some background noise to please mute yourselves. Feel free to unmute yourself if you ever need to. If you want to say something, if you want to join in, we're going to have a couple of kind of games where you can name something or come up with some ideas. We're going to have a writing prompt at the end where you're going to be able to share what you wrote if you decided to participate in that. Leave comments in the comments section at any point. My lovely, wonderful co-host, Agnesa, she will be in the comments. You'll see her a lot. She'll be sharing the contact info for all of our artists, and she's going to be selecting some of your comments and questions to read aloud to our artists after they go on. Lastly, again, thank you so much for being here. I couldn't do this without you all. Thank you for my guests who are here, who are going to be our featured guests sharing their work. And thank you for the audience too, because what would it be if we just have guests sharing without an audience here to watch? So now, before we begin, Agnesa, my co-host, will read you the lineup of the guests who will be featured during this workshop and a variety show. Hi, everyone. Agnesa here. So um, as I'm going to read this off, I just want to apologize in advance if I butcher anyone's name. I'm going to try my best. Okay, so first up is Anya Khan, who is a globally awarded, collected, and exhibited figurative artist from Oregon. She will be showing us some of her colored pencil and digital pieces and answering some audience questions afterwards. Next, we will have a few poems by Ashley Lanuza, who is a published author. Her poetry focuses on the search for identity and belonging in a multicultural family and melting pot society. I love that. Then we will have Luis Fernando Robles, he is a Mexican folk guitarist and singer who actually played the music for us at the beginning of the show while we set up. He will play another three original songs for us a little later in the show, two of which he will discuss and one instrumental piece which we will play during the writing prompt for you near the end of the workshop. After we will have Phoenix Ennis, who is a visual artist from Alberta, Canada. He's had a steady art career for the past 13 years and has painted over 25,000 paintings so far. Wow. That's actually 2,500, not 25,000. Okay, 25,000. Yeah. <laughs> Still a lot, but not that much. I was going to say, wow. He will show us a variety of his work. And then Nixelia Webb, sorry if I mispronounced it. Um, we'll go next to share some of her creepy, eerie mixed media art. Cool. And then lastly, Ashley Lanusa will return to share a few more poems with us. And I'll go ahead and hand it back to Adina. Hi, everyone. I'm back. <laughs> Stay tuned for as many artists as you can. Be as engaged as you'd like. Our artists are here to perform for you in a way, and they love audience engagement. And now, without further ado, let's just jump right in. Our very first artist today is Anya Khan. A uh, little bio about her. Anya is from Detroit, Michigan, but currently lives in Eugene, Oregon. She is a multifaceted creative entrepreneur and a globally awarded, collected, and exhibited figurative artist and photographer, graphic and web designer, a podcast host, a published author, as well as a teacher and an inspirational speaker. <laughs> Lots of things going on there. Her work has been presented in over 300 exhibitions in over 10 different countries. And Anya will be showing us some of her colored pencil and digital art and answering some audience questions afterwards. What a nice intro. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nice to meet you all. All right, let me screen share here. So um, here's my website. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the process. So as an artist, I have been a digital artist for 15 plus years, as well as a graphic and web designer. And the reason why I chose to stick in digital is because I have been allergic to most art supplies, as well as water, most foods, vibration, heat and cold, as well as a plethora of other things that left me bedridden for 11 and a half years. So in no diagnosis, no understanding of what it was, but I needed something to do that made me feel worthwhile because I couldn't work a full-time job and I couldn't function normally and no one had answers. 
So I started doing art and I did it in a, in a digital manner. I've always been an artist since I was a kid, always loved to do things. And the really exciting thing is, is when I got asked to do this, I had only been doing colored pencil now for about, I want to say six months since quarantine. And that is because I finally got diagnosed and I finally got the right treatment and I've been able to jump back into traditional media, which is really huge to be able to not sit at a computer and create, but being able to like hold a colored pencil or do something. Of course I'm limited. I can't oil paint or whatever. I still have to stick to more dry mediums. Um, so let's, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to show you some of the digital stuff that I do. So these are some of the digital paintings. I'm going to go back here real quick to early years. And as you can see in the early years, this would be 2004, 2005. The work was really dark. It has some undertones of abuse or volatile situations, which are things that I had dealt with in my life as well, which I do think that's an association of why I also had health problems. So um, I have a background in psychology and there's a lot of interesting things about why people get sick and how as uh, when we're young, if we're abused or we're malnutritioned or not treated well in our later years in life, it affects our health. So you can see pictures here where you can see there's health struggles for me. I would depict things like death. There's a lot of uh, somber feelings to them. There always seems to be some hint of death. For many of those years, I was on the verge of dying. My body was falling apart. And this was one of the only things that kept me alive. And I have a pretty strong will to live. So as things move on, you can see things start to get more colorful and they shift. Um, this was around the time when I ended up getting on a feeding tube formula and actually getting some nutrition in my body, which helped me be able to think. Still no diagnosis, but you can see from the early years. And now this is more of my newer pieces. They're just a lot different. There's a lot more life to them. Not that there isn't a hint of darkness because... I'm always going to have a hint of that. It has marked me. You know, it has left its mark. So this is where I've jumped into colored pencil. And I love it very much. I can't stop producing it. And I just started down here a bit of a Halloween series. So we're dealing with the bride, you know, Wednesday, poison ivy, you know, things like that. And as you can see, I'm also very attached to uh, the Day of the Dead, which I know we have a wonderful Mexican artist here. So I'm very attached to that holiday due to the fact of all the loss and all the closeness to death I felt. So there's this, this need to want to honor being alive and also honor those that haven't really made it through and have struggled through through lots of things in life. And so that's that's the work I do. And that's why I do it. I just want to say I wouldn't I wouldn't be here without it. Really cool portrayed like the Dia de los Muertos stuff. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. I actually have a Day of the Dead tattoos as well. I do. I did just notice your Day of the Dead tattoo. <laughs> yep, I do. It's awesome. Um, and so it's by I a lovely artist. I would never put any of my own art on myself. <laughs> but yeah, I do love that we have, you know, a girl from Oregon who really identifies with like Mexican culture and our Mexican artist, he really identifies with Irish culture. And we have people in the audience from Northern Ireland who are going to love that too. So I love the mix of like cultures and what really yeah. speaks to your soul and not being limited by, you know, certain things that you think that you're supposed to fit into. We're, we're artists. We don't fit into little boxes. That's true. Just, I feel very strongly that it really just gets into my soul. And I felt like it's one of the few holidays in the world that seems to understand how I feel about death and how to honor that part. Because in America, you know, we get in black and we're all somber and we're dark and we're changing now. But over the years, it's not, death hasn't been celebrated in the same way. And I am glad to see that, you know, the United States is shifting. So yeah. yeah. So that's kind of what I do. And 
And the only other thing would be showing the photography. And I don't know if you want me to show that or you want to move on. I'm totally open. Go ahead and show us a few photos. We still have some time. Sure. So the photography started um, right at, as I got on the feeding tube formula and I needed a way because I couldn't really sit at my computer anymore and I needed to get moving a little bit and try to heal. And so a lot of um, these photographs come from a place of me trying to work through the really dark time in my illness, kind of like a visual journal away. You know, the person's always missing their face you're seeing more hands, more body. It was me getting in touch with my physical form, you know, getting in touch with my body. As you can see, again, you know, we're, we're visiting that death feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's all self-portraiture. There's nothing, nobody in here that isn't, isn't me. I mean, I'm sure that maybe like one or two things I've worked with a friend, but I don't think any of them are up here. They're mostly self, self portraits. I use a remote control and um, yeah, this feels like quarantine now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell yeah. us how you got into photography. Is that always something you were into? You know, I've always really loved photography. As a kid, I had this little Kodak and I loved to take pictures. I had 110 film and I'd go around and take pictures. And of course, back then you had to wait for a week and a half for the film to get developed. So I always liked it, but I, I like to take pictures of nature. And so like down here would be more of what I what I was interested in, taking pictures of nature and birds and whatever, and doing female or, uh, you know, um, just portraits of humans wasn't something I, I had ever really thought of or ever had an interest in. It started one day when I wanted to document something. I was documenting my weight gain because I went down to like 114 pounds and I'm 5'9". And I was like very, very, very sick. And when I started to gain weight on that feeding tube formula, the idea was to take a photo and to remember that moment that I gained weight. And then it just turned into this. So right. kind of interesting. Wow. wow. So yes, but no, but yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Thank you. And I love the story behind it too, how it was like a, a healing journey for you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's very, um, very raw. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful too. I, I have an appreciation for sort of um, dark things, but um, in a beautiful light, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. And I also really, um, I like how you kind of have a little bit of a transition from a lot darker to a little bit more hopeful. It's good to see that transition. I have an art book of the last 13 years of my career and you could, I can look through it and see the transition into healing. It's, it's neat. So yeah. thank you. Agnesa, feel free to read some of the comments and um, possibly questions if there are any from the audience. Yeah. So um, Nicholas Warab said that is amazing that you're able to model and take pictures at the same time. And I totally agree. I cannot believe that you actually did that yourself. Like, right. oh, wow. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I've tried to photograph other people. Like do, I do it professionally, like headshots and whatever, but artistic, I really can't. It's like, I know what I see, but I won't, you know, I can't make somebody else do it. It's weird. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're having a lot of appreciation in the comments. Oh, um, that's so <laughs> sweet. And then also I noticed there was a Frito Kahlo in there. Someone also mentioned that. Yep. So I didn't know who she was until a friend of mine who had been really entrenched in the art world brought her up to me. And she's like, went to art school and whatever, and I don't have any schooling. I just was doing it in my basement to live, basically. <laughs> you know, like, I need to stay alive. Um, not really in my basement. But she and I met in an exhibition, and she said, you should really look into Frida Kahlo and Cindy Sherman. And I was like, okay. So I went and I looked, and I got really familiar with both of these artists. And of course, how can you not love you know, Frida, but this was before the Frida craze and how everybody loves her. And I think that's great. Like, I, I think that's wonderful. But, you know, I, I got really attached to her, you know, because of my illness and, you know, for her to be taken to her first exhibition, you know, in a bed. And it was like, wow, somebody understands me being sick. And so when I finally got diagnosed, this Frida that you see here is the one that I did within the month that I got diagnosed and had hope. 
And so it was called Brave Immortality. Uh, a, a parallel that I can see from the outside is uh, like uh, Frida painted her own reality and her mm -hmm. journey and, and your photography, you're doing the same thing. And, and every artist should embrace whatever part of them that is the artist. Salvador Dali once said, I paint Dali, you paint you, you know? Yeah, I could see that totally. And even these digital, I'm all the model in all the digital. I hate using the word model, subject. You know, I'm the person in, in all this digital work as well, where I've taken reference photos and, you know, besides Frida, obviously, because I'm, I'm not Frida, but a lot of the other ones are, are self, you know, portraits as well, which is weird because I don't even like looking at myself. It's kind of like how I'm able to process life, you know, is like being able to almost look in a mirror and be able to process things in a, in a visual representation. So right. it's an interesting thing. I feel so loved. Thank you. <laughs> Your art is amazing, really. So I wanted to tell everybody a little bit of like a, how I actually got Anya to be here on this show. I just saw her as a recommendation that Facebook offered just based on like some of the art that I follow, some of the art that I view. And Facebook apparently was like, you might like this person. So I went on her page and I was just like, oh, it's so good. And <laughs> I messaged her and told her about the workshop. And luckily for me, Ani was like, yeah, definitely. I'd love to be there. I don't need any prep. I'm really good at public speaking. Don't even, don't, just throw me in and <laughs> let me do my thing. This is it. Aw, uh, thanks. Well, that's cool. I don't advertise on Facebook, so I guess Facebook was giving me some props. I like that. <laughs> I feel like I'm always fighting that silly algorithm. So it's nice to know someone found me that way. Yeah. I mean, Facebook is terribly annoying sometimes, but you know, it's good for some things. <laughs> it's true. All right. Well, thank you, Anya. Thank that you very much. Absolutely amazing. If you, there are any other questions for you in the chat, go ahead and okay. put those answers. I do see a couple that we didn't get time for, but okay. our very next featured guest is here. She just rushed from work to be here and I appreciate her trying to be here punctually. So up next is Ashley Lanuza. Ashley will tell us a little bit about a book that she wrote and share a little bit from it. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Anya, for uh, presenting. I'm so sorry that I missed it up during my commute, but I'm sure it was lovely and I can't wait to see the art that's posted afterwards. Uh, um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Ashley Lanuza. I'm from Los Angeles, California, and I recently published a book called My Heart of Rice, A Poetic Filipino-American Experience with the help of Alina um, as my marketing editor. So that was a really great experience. And I'm gonna be sharing a few poems with you all today and if you have any questions, um, Alina has all the information to my website and my links. Yeah. Can I share? <laughs> so um, Ashley will read two short poems for us now, and then she will come back at the end of the show and she will read a few of her longer poems. And as Ashley mentioned, there will be a writing prompt and it will be based on one of the lines from one of her poems. Okay, ready? Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. So I get background about my book. Essentially, I talk about uh, what it means to be Filipino American uh, for myself, starting with the food that I grew up with. I was born here, but my family migrated from the Philippines before I was born. And so my relationship to that identity, starting with food and how that's kind of interacted with um, in school, in college, when I learn a lot more about uh, communities that are out there presently and history that's out there and kind of understanding what the, how the identity is defined by me and how it fits into my life. And coincidentally enough, tomorrow is actually Philippine American National History Month. So it's the beginning of that. So this is just great timing. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So birthday parties. Glass noodles mixed with calamansi. White noodles topped with pork rinds and shrimp sauce. Spaghetti noodles with hot dogs and banana ketchup. Thick noodles, brown and sweet like me. I slurp, the pasta slapping my lips, sauce covering the corners of my mouth. I smile in anticipation of the long life you say I'll have. Quick question for you about that. I know I didn't prep you for this or anything, but 
I am working with an author from China and she keeps talking about these long life noodles that they eat. Is that what this is about? Are they also called glass noodles or less? Yeah. So generally when um, a person has like their birthday, it's kind of like a superstitious belief to eat noodles on your birthday for a promise of a long life. And so in this poem, I highlight different kinds of Filipino dishes that have noodles in them. Um, Kalamansi is a type of lemon lime it's like sweeter than a lemon, um, but it's really good. And then so you add that to some of the noodles to add some, you know, some acidity and sourness into that. Um, and so there's like three different kinds of, four different kinds of noodles that I talk about um, in this one and, and, and all pertaining to this idea of a long life and how that idea of a long life comes from this, you know, this just caring feeling of like love and like, I want you to have a happy and long life. So here's some food, right? <laughs> Also, it's almost dinner time, so I wanted to share a food poem. <laughs> For me. Getting everybody hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, how there's a little bit of knowledge you have to have about this when you go into reading it. You know, maybe some research that somebody might need to do in order to figure out all of it out. Again, I only recognize where it says long life in the last line because of my Chinese author that I'm working with. And she also ate the long life noodles on her birthday. But I didn't realize that it's not just, you know... A, something like that she particularly did. It wasn't just a family tradition. It wasn't even just in China. It's like an Asian American thing as well that mm -hmm. you continue this tradition after you immigrate from your country. And I love that. And I love yeah. that you have traditional foods that bless you with a longer life on the day of your birthday. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah. So this one's a rather shorter one. It's titled Three. Hearts hold hundreds of homes. Mine waved three flags and didn't know what to do when everyone else seemed to just have one. So this poem is kind of at the end of a bunch of other poems that kind of like it leads up to, but essentially like my background. So my family's from the Philippines and I grew up in the US in Los Angeles, which is a very diverse city. And um, my stepdad is actually Latino. He's from Mexico and he only spoke Spanish. And so I, and he was just very like, integrated into his culture and his, especially his food. So I grew up with that and learning how to speak Spanish and learning Mexican culture through my friends and through uh, my stepfather and like his family. And so I found myself in this weird kind of like internal conflict predicament where I was like, okay, I know Spanish way better than Filipino <laughs> and like uh, but I'm living in America and like my, my dad's side of the family says I'm American. And then it just, it was just a lot of like, cultural differences all happening in one person. Um, <laughs> and so I kind of grapple with that uh, in this poem in three, to like kind of understand how it feels when you don't feel like you fit into a specific box or specific category of what you're supposed to be uh, or supposed to do. So that's where that's from. And then that's what I have for now. And then I have more later. Okay. <laughs> And as I introduced you, before you were here, when I told people what you're going to be sharing, I said that your poetry focuses on the search for identity and belonging in a multicultural family and a melting pot society. And I believe we're going to have a poem from you that is about your coming of age here in America and experiencing that melting pot society as well, right? Yes. Awesome. Okay, then. Well, that's what's coming up uh, at the end of the show. So Ashley will close out the show for us. So you know, stay to the very end of the show if you can. Up next, we have Luis Fernando Robles. He's from Chihuahua, Mexico. He is a folk guitarist and he's obsessed with Irish music and culture. He told me that he feels like an Irish person on the wrong side of the Atlantic. <laughs> And I know we actually mentioned earlier, we have an audience member from Northern Ireland who's probably going to be your biggest fan, Luis. And what Luis also does when he isn't making music is he is a lawyer. He shared with me that music is therapy because he feels like an artist in a lawyer's body. Hi guys. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, Luis is the one who played music for us in the beginning when, if you were here before the show began. Usually we don't do live shows, we usually do recordings because Zoom has issues, but it seemed like Luis was not having any issues with that in the beginning. So for the very first song, I'm actually going to have him try to play his song live for us. Would you prefer your song in Spanish or would you prefer your Irish folk song? I think it's better if I do the, the Spanish one. <laughs> yeah, and the, the Spanish one was great too because your vocals were really loud and because Zoom captures voice very well and it you know doesn't do so well with music. Okay, Luis will afterwards talk about the lyrics to the song, what they mean. Again, they are in Spanish, 
So if you're completely lost, just you know, enjoy, enjoy the music for what it is and enjoy his vocals and then stay tuned for what those lyrics mean. Okay, well, as I've been introduced before, I don't know if you guys would like to see the guitar or would you like to see me? I don't know. I always like to see the guitar because I think it's very, it's more entertaining. So that's what I'll do. Um, here it goes. Estoy, estoy buscando a alguien, alguien que viaje conmigo hasta el fin, hasta el fin del abismo. Oh, voy a cortar. Camino, camino sin rumbo fijo, solo el cielo, solo el cielo es mi amigo. Y por más que lo intente, asomado en el espejo, lo que en ti siempre admiré. Le faltaba mi reflejo y que me parta un rayo si algún día me cayó. No quiero dejar de intentar y aunque no haya nadie cantando aquí a mi lado, no voy a dejar de tocar, no voy a dejar de tocar. Soy un terco enviciado, enviciado en el sonido encajonado, encajonado en emociones, y por más que lo intente, asomado en el espejo. Lo que en ti siempre admiré, le faltaba mi reflejo y que me parta un rayo si algún día me cayó. No quiero dejar de intentar y aunque no haya nadie cantando aquí a mi lado, no voy a dejar que me parta un rayo si algún día me cayó. Quiero dejar de intentar y aunque no haya nadie cantando aquí a mi lado, no voy a dejar de tocar, no voy a dejar de tocar, no voy a dejar de tocar. That was beautiful. Thank you, guys. Right. It sounded all right. Yeah, it sounded great. So again, the guitar was barely there, as we were told by some of the audience, but your vocals were gorgeous. We heard it very well. So that was, this was the perfect song for a live Zoom attempt. And in the second one, we're going to play the video so that we don't have issues with the guitar. But now, what about you tell us a little bit about the song? Okay, well, the first lines are like, um, estoy, estoy buscando a alguien, and it basically translates to I'm searching for someone. And this song comes from a place where I feel alone in what I like to do here in my country, because everybody, everybody is playing all kinds of stuff that doesn't have to do anything with, you know, 
or, or at least I don't know any artists that play the kind of songs and the kind of Celtic, Irish, that kind of music, and that mix into the folk and uh, music of my, my country. And well, the song says, I'm searching for someone in the first verse, uh, someone that travels with me, that travels with me to the end of the abyss. What that basically means is I'm just looking for someone to take this crazy journey, like an artist that would be willing to, you know, join me. And then it goes like, Estoy, estoy buscando. It says basically that I'm just traveling the way. Just like, you know, journey and then, then it goes then it goes saying the uh, for more than i tried that's the bridge to the to the chorus that the, uh, it would be y por más que lo intenté, that would be for more than i tried and looking in the mirror uh, all the things that i admired in you were missing in my reflection and it's just basically for me I mix this song with, you know, uh, my admiration for some other uh, artists and the things that I lack as an artist that the artists that I admire do have. And, and I'm just saying like, for more than I tried, uh, it just, I can seem to find those virtues in myself yet. I hope someday uh, I'd be able to, you know, see my reflection and say, okay, there it is. <laughs> but, right. So quick question for you. This wasn't one of the ones we planned, but when you're thinking about that you're searching for somebody to you know, tra travel in this world with you, when you first started writing the song, was it more like uh, you were, in, did you have in mind, like, I know you're supposed to, you know you're gonna get married in a week or two here. So is it more of a romantic song or is it anybody like-minded friends that you'd like to accompany you? I tried to uh, constantly and consciously avoid romance on my songs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's one of the lawyer, after all. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons I sing in English sometimes, even though it's not my first language. When you sing in English, uh, I think it's easier for for you to convey emotions without suddenly everything turning into a cheesy romantic song. It's easier for me to make a song about not anything else than romance in English that it is in Spanish because everything goes back to, you know, being sweethearts and all, all that stuff. And in Spanish, it, it just all sounds so cheesy for me. But yeah, that kind of, you know, mental barrier. Okay, well, I before we play your second song, I did have two questions I wanted to ask you. First of all, how long ago did you start playing music? And then my next question, and you can just go from one to the other is, when you were a child, how did your parents ground you when you were in trouble? <laughs> yeah, well, I started playing music when I was 14 years old. I had a brief encounter with violin playing. I mostly like to play violin because of Zelda video games and I wanted to play all those soundtrack. But then uh, I didn't really stick with it. And there was this one time uh, we had like a family reunion and my aunt, sister of my mother, uh, had her, her boyfriend come that now he's my uncle. He brought his guitar and I was like 13, 14 years old and I saw him, you know, just blew us all away entertain us for like two hours with funny songs and playing the guitar and you know just like this close intimate family setting where he just played and it just instantly went like I want to do that for me you know I, I want I want to play the guitar I want to entertain people with my music and not so much make them laugh because he has a more funny approach to it but that was, that was my inspiration for playing guitar, you know. I spent most of my time, you know, playing guitar, playing guitar. I just fell in love. Uh, like I told you, Alina, I was addicted to it. I mean, literally addicted. And I suffered from withdrawal syndrome every time when I wouldn't play. And my parents noticed that. And when I used to fail my classes and not do very well in school because I wasn't doing homework, I was just, you know, uh, drilling on the guitar and just always, you know, I was into, you know, electric guitar and I was wanting to be the fastest and want to be like Petrucci and, you know, Slash and stuff. And <laughs> yeah. So whenever I failed my exams and stuff, my, my father uh, and my mother, all they had to do was ground the guitar and I would go nuts. You know, that's all they had to do. No video games, 
didn't matter cell phone, no, no anything, no friends. I could do everything, just not play the guitar. And I would literally <laughs> pull my eyelids in stress. You know, I have to play, fix me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the background on my obsession of guitar playing. I think a lot of artists here can relate to the the stress of not being able to pursue your art. Like I'm thinking even Anya probably, if you you know took away all ability for her to <laughs> to make her art, like you'd feel like you're going crazy, right? Totally. Yep. Yeah. And hopefully I'll have time to keep making art because as Elena said, I'm getting married and actually my fiance is right here on the transmission and I send oh. you lots of love, babe. And, <laughs> and yeah, well, if you want to kick it away with the other one song. That's yep. Nice. Yeah, I'll pull up the file for the other song and I'll play that one from the recording. While she does that, you're having a lot of appreciation in the comments. That was really beautiful. And um, people are loving your voice. You have a very talented voice. And Thanks. they really enjoyed you um, translating your lyrics. Yeah, I'll post the, the lyrics when my turn is over. I just post them and I'll translate them over there so people can look at them. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, already here. If I was an Irish lad, I sing my heart out, trying to impress a girl by some old canal. I'd have a favorite pub where I would drink till I went numb, dancing while the fiddle. In the bar I roared. Leaving Galway to feel the breeze, drive to Connemara, adventuring. Visit Phoenix Park and ride a tandem bike. With the one I love, lay on the grass If I was an Irish lad, I'd sing my heart out Trying to impress a girl by some old canal I'd have a favorite pub, where I would drink till I went numb Dancing while the fiddle reels in the bar and roar a stranger and fight with a friend go shopping to Henry Street again speak some Gaelic just for good crack go to a session and try not to fuck it up if I was an Irish lad I sing my heart out trying to impress a girl by some old canal I'd have a favorite pop where I would drink till I went numb dancing while the fiddle reels the bar and roars was an Irish lad, I sing my heart out, trying to impress a girl by some old canal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Thanks. Great work. Yeah, so you want to tell us a little bit about that song? Yeah, well, uh, for me, uh, going to Ireland is one of my utmost dreams. Uh, I want to visit that country some someday soon, and hopefully me and my fiance can go. And basically, I'm obsessed, like Alina said, I, I like that Irish sound. I mean, that's the thing I love the most is the music, the folk music, you know, it's, it's for me just, it's my sound. It's what makes me vibrate 
and I just made like a bucket list of I want to go to Connemara, I want to go to Galway, live there for a little while. Um, I don't know, I just want to go to Phoenix Park because Phoenix Park is a, is a very big uh, park in Dublin and I want to ride a tandem bike with the one I love who is watching this. <laughs> and yeah, so that's, that's just a bucket list and it's more of my like my simpler work uh, lyric wise or you know it's not so deep but I really like the the guitar work on this one I mean because it kind of you know conveys the the Irish sound a little which I've been trying to emulate for a long time I'm, I'm not saying I'm I'm there I'm working towards it okay. I grew up in Dublin oh. <laughs> awesome. really awesome yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question, Mitchell, in a sec then. So um, we have another person here who's, a, who's one of our audience members. I, I heard from Belfast. Yeah, from Northern Ireland. And she says in the comments, she can confirm all these things in the lyrics are true. Do you feel <laughs> like they yeah. are? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I actually unmuted and I shared the video just so I could. Yeah, very good. When I heard the, when I heard the song, it, I thought it was somebody Irish singing it, to be honest with you. So I like looked over. So yeah, very good job. I love Thanks. it. Thank you. That's awesome. So I'm wondering for those, so you said you thought it was an Irish person singing it. So my question is, can you hear that he has a Spanish accent or does it just sound like an Irish person? I can now, it's hard to, you can hear it in, in the music. It's more of like the trained ear because you hear that kind of music all the time. So it, it always sounds different when you hear somebody else sing it. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. that it has like that extra little like, oh, something is unique about this, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm still working on, you know, writing in English because, you know, I've been speaking English for my whole life. I've been attending bilingual school since I was like three or four years old. So I do speak, I, I do fully understand English. And, but, you know, with lack of practice and actually not talking with anyone that really speaks it, some things are still a bit awkward or some phrases I, are, I use are not entirely, you know, I wouldn't say correct, but they just seem like a little bit awkward. And that's that's why I use the inner four. So people can just tell me, oh, this part doesn't sound like some something someone would say in English. And I'll, I'll, I'll take a note of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, we are going to move on in just a minute here. But I did want to tell you something from the comments section. Um, usually my co-host reads these. But this is a friend of mine from Northern Ireland that I mentioned earlier. And she shared uh, in the comments that you are invited to come visit her in Belfast. And she will accompany you across a few places, example, Galway and Connemara. So you now have a connection in Northern Ireland. <laughs> Thank you all for, for your kind words. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks for the music. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And I will move on to the very next person. But just so you all know, uh, there's going to be one more song by Luis. At the end of the show, there's going to be a writing prompt. And it's going to be one of his instrumental pieces that we're going to play while all of us take five minutes to write. Okay, so now... Oh, and by the way, in case some of you missed it, while Luis was playing his music, if you saw on the... If you have your... Zoom turn on gallery mode, you could see that our next artist, Phoenix Ennis, he was actually painting. So it was a little bit of like a collab. He was painting to Luis's music. I love painting the music, actually. Yeah, that was awesome. But um, yes, so the person you just heard speak, that is Phoenix Ennis. He is our next artist. And what I have to tell you about Phoenix is he told me he doesn't like labels and definitions, doesn't even title his work sometimes. But if you were to refer to him, when I interviewed him, kind of, what do you do? You know, what do I call you? He said, I'm basically Bob Ross on acid. <laughs> So, but if we were to, to give some of these labels and definitions, Phoenix Ennis is a visual artist from Alberta, Canada. In his work, he combines painting, animation, and music. He has had a steady art career for the past 13 years, and he'll be showing us some of this work, answering some questions, and we will also show some of his animations that he made from his paintings. Now, a few more details. He was a featured artist at the Astral Harvest Musical Festival. He's also a festival artist because that is where he primarily painted and sold his work prior to COVID, of course. And his art was also featured on a clothing line called Acid Math Apparel. And he's also the host of a television show called Painting with Pat. So there you go. That's the Bob Ross reference then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good icebreaker. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I love it. All right, so I'm gonna pull up some of your art here and share it with the audience. By the way, when Phoenix sent me the files that he'd like me to share, the name of that folder was called Message from Beyond. <laughs> I love it. When I saw that, I was like, okay, this is going to be a quirky artist that's going to be <laughs> really fun for all of us to talk with. Okay, one second. Well, just sort of uh, maybe hold up a couple paintings while we talk here so the folks can see some of my work. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead and do that as I pull everything up. Right here. Is that one of your newest ones? I'd say it's about a month old, that one. Usually the ones that, that, I, that I nail on the first try sell pretty quick and then sort of the longer I have them, the better they look. So it ends up like they all end up better, you know? Yeah, that last one's powerful. I love it. Yeah, this was uh, my protest inspired piece. I did like a whole sort of 2020 series, I guess you could call it. I thought that. I thought it was really relevant to what's going on now. This, uh, this one too is a little bit dark, but uh, also... Uh, my quarantine inspired painting. <laughs> yeah. So actually the very last workshop we had, uh, one of our artists introduced me to a new term I haven't heard about, but she called herself an artivist, which is a combination of activist and artist. So that, <laughs> artivist. that previous painting that you showed, the um, protest inspired one, that is an example of being an artivist. Ooh, awesome. Do you like painting space a lot? So I was going to ask, is your shirt, is that one of your paintings on your shirt? Yeah, this is uh, the, one of the acid math apparel shirts. There's some guy, I'll get in a shot here, but there's some guys sort of getting in a boat and the, the spiral galaxy just kind of becomes the water in it. Yeah. So it's awesome. an illusion that I like to create where you can't really tell where the water stops and the sky starts. Yeah. Do you want to hold up the one you were just working on um, so that people can see what you were just doing in case they missed you working on it? Uh, the one that you were painting during, oh yeah, you're painting that one too. You were painting two different paintings. Yeah, sort of jumping on them all, but this one I just sort of like the pastel feel or something of it. Yeah. Usually I try and do something like I'm kind of halfway in between doing realistic stuff and then also keeping it a bit spontaneous. Yeah. So that you get sort of a mixture of both. I love that. I really like the flower ones, man. They're so beautiful. Okay. And I have your files ready to pull up and share here. Sure. And I'm going to show those images and I'm going to have you talk a little bit about them if you want to add anything about them. Okay, so let's start with this one. Okay, so that one, I don't know, I, I kind of have the, a running theme where I'll paint people sort of looking over the edge into like a vast abyss. Sometimes I'll make the, the floor that he's laying on like a space grid. So it's sort of like representative of space time or something. There's another example of that. Yeah, a little hard to see on this picture, but all the stars are actually different colors, pretty wide variety in there. But yeah. Awesome. The camera tends to make them look white. But <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you can see the color. That's awesome. They're also <laughs> like uh, black light reactive and some of them glow in the dark. Ooh. So they have like different weird lighting. Uh, usually at festivals, there's always a black light around and that sort of thing. So all of a sudden the stars are actually glowing in the painting, which is uh, that neat. Is, that's super cool. So a question for you that just popped into my head. Is this person in his underwear? <laughs> he, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there a reason for that? Casual Friday. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's the next one. So this one I would kind of reference Cahill Gibran in that uh, pain is the crack in the shell of understanding. And this one, there's sort of light coming from the inside of his head. Yeah. I love Khalil. Is that something that inspires you often is quotes or books by philosophers? I mean, sometimes, yeah. I, I do. Uh, sometimes I'll do, I guess you could call it like pop art. Like um, I did uh, Nikola Tesla holding a ray gun. He looked like a James Bond pose. <laughs> and then I did another one with Albert Einstein wearing like a straight jacket and, and looking all serious. It was kind of sort of satire, I guess you could call it. It's like, I'm not crazy. <laughs> like, it's uh, awesome. But it's all relative, uh, yeah. no, you know, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the next one. So here's another example of the water just sort of transitioning into the surface of space discovery of like gravitational waves that sort of uh, gives it a whole another element when I do these sort of things. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you did mention that to me that you love kind of playing with sky and water and combining them till you can't tell where it begins, where it ends, right? Well, this, like this could never exist in the reality of our universe, and yet you can paint it and have a, a convincing illusion that you could almost get in the boat and go for a rip down the galaxy. You know? Yeah. And it, I find it gives longevity, too, to a piece if it kind of makes your head spin a little bit when you look at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's another one of those where you combine sky and water. This one's probably my favorite from last year, and she's sort of like up to her, you know, like, submerged in it like uh in the deep end of the universe i guess yeah <laughs> is there anything you were feeling when you painted this one i mean i i try not to think when i'm painting really i, I usually don't like look back and try and figure out what it all means either i just kind of just do it i don't know <laughs> yeah interesting I find that interesting because I hear different responses from different artists. You know, some artists are like, I was going through a lot of anxiety and depression when I made this. Like we had an artist from Germany in our second workshop where she said that when she's depressed, she makes her most powerful art. And then for other people, they just want to clear their mind of all thoughts and all I mean, feelings. Somewhere in between like uh, trying to convey this emotion of like, you know, you're like in over your head and at the same, so it is emotion for me, but it's also half, a half conscious effort so it's like I don't know where it's kind of coming from mm -hmm. you know what I mean where if it's a direct story like about myself the way the other artist did where she's portraying her own journey mm -hmm. I, I'm, I guess I'm trying to just sort of portray a general journey there's one more uh, I, like I paint so much I actually one time I went to a friend's house. I hadn't been there in a very long time and I saw a painting on the wall and I didn't realize that I was the one that painted it because it had been such a long time. Oh. <laughs> like, oh, that's a cool painting. <laughs> Just totally no recollection. Of, I, I usually do one a day and uh, yeah, about 300 a year is my average. Wow, that's amazing. I have a weird work ethic where I just don't stop until it's basically a piece this done yeah do so you usually work on multiple pieces at the same time right like you just did during no it's like one at a time like this uh, when i'm working on a piece it's the only painting in existence at that moment I, I heard a quote from an artist who said that and i can't remember who what his name was but i was like oh that's really neat you know <laughs> it's the only one that exists to the point where you forget about all others and don't even recognize yeah, them on your know, friend's like, walls <laughs> approach it like this is the only painting that's ever going to exist you know yeah it kind of helps. Yeah, you can't really paint uh, without emotion, and the other artist on tonight, you know, really conveyed conveyed that in her work. Mm -hmm. I love this one. This girl sort of holding her heart, and her heart would be like the center of the the nebula, I guess. Okay. I was wondering, it kind of looks like she has this, like she's clothing herself. Yeah, she's heart. like kind of cloaked in the universe or something. Yeah. But... That's awesome. That one, uh, the next one is uh, like the sort of a burning, the burning core and just holding, I don't, I don't really know what it means. <laughs> I just took like a, a neutron star and put it into the hands. It looks awesome. It also looks powerful. Like this is my burning heart, you know. What does this, does this one have a meaning? The meaning, I guess, in this one be, you know, we're, we're all the universe experiencing itself. And it's like, when you take the mask off, you, you, you learn that, I guess. And that's sort of representative of all time and space going back into his mind there. Because if you really think about it, that we really are the whole history of the universe kind of jammed into this intersection in space and time. Yeah, that's beautiful. This one's uh, the, the lovers, you know, uh, two, two galaxies colliding, I guess, yeah. in a one. This one's very different from the rest of yours. Here, instead of the background being the galaxies, the people are. Yeah. Hmm. This guy literally had, I don't know if you can zoom into the top of his head there, but he's literally got like a Tesla coil of lightning coming out the back of his brain. Like, boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, the neurons <laughs> are firing again. So is this kind of how you feel when your brain's like, paint, sit down and paint? <laughs> this is me in 2020 just trying to process the U.S. election. 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, <my> God. <laughs> so this next one is actually um, the very first one that I think I saw of all of your art. So the bit of, I guess, bio on how I met Phoenix is I saw his art posted in an art group. And every single time I saw his art, I would comment on it and tell him how much I love it. And I reached out to him. Um, and I guess in a way, Facebook helped me here as well, because it was a Facebook group for all kinds of weird, super unique art. But I saw this one and I don't know why, but something in it really connected with me. I love how real the water looks. And again, I like how you explained that combination of sky and water just melding together till you can't tell apart the two. Yeah, this one woman is sort of sh showing a little bit signs of like age, you know, and it's supposed to be representative of like she's drinking the fountains of life or, or something like that. Well, I'm about to turn 30, so maybe that, maybe I was feeling my age. <laughs> I literally looked down to start a painting and like 10 years went by. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is the video or is that what the photo? This is the photo. I do have a video, an animation of this too. So I'll let everybody take a look at what it looks like as a photo. And then I'm going to pull up the animation. And while I pull that up, you can go ahead and tell us how you animate your um, paintings and how you got the idea for it. Yeah, uh, well, the first time I, I actually, uh, I can thank Facebook for that too. I saw like a, a, a video there where people had animated their art and I was like, I really want to figure out how to do this because you can see it now there is sort of, uh, I paint these things in acrylic, but because of computer technology, you just sort of cut out where you want to, to not move and point arrows in the direction that you want to move. So it's pretty simple to create them. Although you do have to have a good flow in the piece that has to loop back onto itself. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I think it's amazing that I can watch a painting come to life like right, right before your eyes. Yeah, I love that you thought of combining the two like that. So mesmerizing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. She's like, just so cool. creating the universe. Yeah. yeah. Just this like inconspicuous little female sitting there <laughs> painting, creating the whole universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to show the next one. That's awesome. So this one here, I actually had another artist who, who does, uh, he's a bit more into animations than me. So uh, it's sort of, he liked my art. And so he went ahead and just sort of made it and sent it to me. Okay. And the other one you made yourself? Yeah. Okay. That's really cool. I'm trying to get to the point where uh, I'm hoping that they can invent like a a projector for your telephone so that I can take these and project it onto a, the nearest wall. Sort of like yeah. a moving art show on the street corner. <laughs> so, so you told me that you did that before you at a, at a festival, right? Yeah, but that's sort of, you need like a full scale stage production stuff to project like that. Yeah. So explain uh, that like to all of us. So there's um, a few groups here on the EDM scene and they sort of project these amazing um, psychedelic patterned visuals, uh, usually behind a, a, uh, the band that's playing or the DJ or, or on a flat wall. And so I've been working in partnership with other sort of artists and, and providing them with basically, basically a theme to their normally generic uh, fractal patterns by sending them an animation like that one and all of a sudden there's a person in it and now it becomes like this whole other alien thing that like a collaborative of artists has helped create. Yeah, that sounds awesome. It sounds really cool. And I did want to ask you one more question. There's something that you said, which was about your successful art career and your, you know, your followers who even during COVID, you're able to sell your art. And you said something to me in our little pre-interview before the show, and that was popularity is the side effect of hard work. And right. I'll to elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I've, I mean, I've painted about 2,500 paintings, which, which is uh, twice as productive as Van Gogh. But the other thing that I noticed as an artist is you have to be like in putting it in day in and day out. The first 10 years were just sort of me honing my skills and trying to find people. 
but after you put your time in, people start to find you. And so it make, gets things get a little bit easier. Yeah. And thankfully, we live in the internet age where where you can reach hundreds and thousands of people online if you know how to do it right. Yeah, and you said to me that your fan base is basically what's keeping you afloat right now and that you have to adapt in times like these and that selling online right now has obviously gone up. So you're kind of taking advantage of that, right? Right. If Lo Da Vinci owned a computer, he would use it to the full extent and then some, you know, <laughs> so I, people... I think people need to embrace all sides of creative art forms, whether it's music, online, digital, or otherwise, especially yeah. in, in these days. And it, like, it, to me, it seems like musicians are just, you know, we're hung out to dry this year, you know, as well as a lot of artists who, no offense, that's the best part of society is, you know, is our creative side. So it's, yeah. Yeah. It's great well, to see people like, coming together like this podcast mm -hmm, definitely and this has been a lot of this has been something that you know i created during coronavirus when we were all kind of lacking that artsy space that community of artists that you know we weren't able to gather so that was the whole point behind this and um i've obviously been really loving it and it seems like other people have been too so i love that so we're gonna have our co-host read a question for you here before we move along to the next person yeah, so uh, Kay Williams asked, do you look at space and galaxies for reference in design and color your paintings? Yes, definitely. Actually, if, if you Google like any galaxy, anything you can think of, just put that in and a galaxy at the end of it and you'd be astonished. Look up Unicorn Nebula. It's literally a, it's literally a unicorn. And it's like, there's a square nebula. It's a perfect square. How do these things happen? <laughs> But yeah, no, I, it's pretty neat. <clears throat> awesome. I'm wondering, this is um, not a question I had planned for you, but I'm wondering if your very first painting, did you start with the whole galaxy theme or is that something you developed later on? Uh, no, I had an art mentor who was a landscape painter, the poet laureate of Ottawa, Patrick White, and he sort of taught me landscapes and then I sort of found my own niche. It's like learning how to play music. Once you know all the chords, you can play your own music. Yeah, I love it. And we'll move along to the very next artist. Thank you so much, Phoenix, for, for having me. Yeah, for sharing this with us, for telling us a little bit about it. Um, it was really awesome having you here. Yeah, when everyone is invited to check out my Facebook after the podcast. Yes, our co-host will leave all of that information in um, the comments section, as she has been doing for all of our artists. All right, again, thanks so much, Phoenix. And Thank now you. we're moving along to Nixalia Webb, who is going to be sharing with us some creepy mixed media art. For example, serial killer themed baseball cards, a box with teeth and eyeballs. And she also has a guitar that looks like bloody gore and has eyeballs and body parts on it, which she will show you next time. This should tempt you to come back. But okay, so Nixalia, another little, a little bit of a bio about her. She says that she makes anything and everything. She doesn't stay with one particular medium. The creepier, the better. So examples are, again, mixed media, crochet, painting, those baseball cards that are also combined, you know, painting, uh, sculpting, cosplay, drag king. She's also a drag king. And how awesome is that? She's actually going to come back <laughs> to our um, show in the future with a drag king performance. And super excited about that okay i'm gonna start with the baseball cards actually okay cool okay so i started creating these literally from a joke <laughs> <laughs> uh, i have i don't know if any of you have ever watched um like the buzzfeed unsolved but there's a bit in there where they're joking about like trading serial killer baseball cards and like wondering if they've ever like created them. By the way, they do, like they're like on the market, but I wanted to like make my own. So I have a book somewhere with like way too many names, like four or five pages just full of names of serial killers. And I have just kind of slowly worked on them. Uh, each card, just the one side that you see takes about six hours to make. Um, and it's just like an image, obviously, that I find offline of these people. 
and put them onto the card via paint with a very tiny paintbrush. Yeah, exactly. Can you actually hold them up and show us how small they are? Okay, yeah, they're a little just like they're literally just I use like the bicycle playing cards. I don't. Right. Yeah, that's like the size of the palm of your hand, a little smaller. Yeah, like it's just it's just a normal card, but it, oh, okay. They're gonna have serial colors on them, and I'm eventually gonna get to the backs. <laughs> what are you gonna do on the back? Uh, like their bio, um, like like you would find on a normal baseball card, like the height, name, age. Uh, how many the, people they killed? Yeah, how many people they've killed, what they're best known for, stuff like that. Okay. So information that no one needs, but a lot of people want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I love, like, for how small they are, they have a lot of detail with the shadowing and <laughs> the recognizable features, too. Yeah. Yeah, they, they take a long, long time, and I don't particularly do, like, I, I paint portraits, but obviously, like, they're not realistic, and the fact that I got these guys so close to the actual pictures, I'm like, oh, I can do this. Cool. Richard <laughs> Ramirez is great. Yeah. So you didn't even know if you could do this, you just decided to try? Yeah, pretty much. Because <laughs> most of my most of my like faces that I do turn very like even if I do get realistic, there always there's always that hint of semi, where it's like ah, this still looks like a cartoon. But so yeah, I'm glad that these got more on the realistic side, and I think the the fact of it being uh black and gray kind of helps that. Mm -hmm. But they are still very cartoony at the same time. Maybe that's just me, but. <laughs> I mean, they do look, uh, they don't look like photos, but I like it yeah. better because of that. <laughs> right. If they, were, if they looked like photos, then it would just look like somebody printed this, you know, this, you know, off the internet and put it on a bunch of baseball cards. The fact, the cool part about this is that they're painted by hand. Yeah, yeah and then uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but all the um, borders are in the language of where these people are from. So right now I have a lot of English ones. Um, a Spanish one. I do have some Russian ones that I'm going to be working on hopefully soon, but I have the borders already made. Where do they go? There you go. I really want to see that. I'm Russian, so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it says Astarozhna, which means caution. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So let's move on to your creepy box, and you can tell us yes. what the box is <laughs> and how you did it. Oh, there you go. She's also showing it on the camera. Oh, yeah, no, I, I grabbed all of them just in case. <laughs> Actually, yeah, let's go ahead and have you show that one in person, and then I'll show the pictures afterwards in case somebody tells me that it was kind of pixelated. Okay, so this is my dice box. Yes, it is for d and I do not play, but I really want to. But I got the outside looking all pretty, and then because I love creepy things and I'm a nerd, the inside is a mimic. So, the like inside is a what? What did you say? They're called mimics. So they're these little creatures that disguise themselves as uh, everyday objects, usually a chest, and they're like little two to five hit things, depending on how low your level is. Yeah. But the uh, right side comes out, and there's more storage for dice at the bottom, and then the tongue part goes up, and it is a rolling tower. Oh, so you can roll the dice in there. Yes, yeah, so like you put them in the, in the top and then it like hits a bunch of uh, platforms and comes out. So that way it's like a fair roll. Nice. Cool. So tell us, actually, I'll ask you uh, afterwards. You have one more to show us, right? I don't have images of it, but show us the face on a board. Yes, my, my unnamed child. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, this one is very, like, Ed Gein inspired. Yeah. Um, but it is 3D, like... You can see the nose. <laughs> yeah, and the eyeball over here. Yeah. Uh, there is, like, hair, and she has eyelashes. This one also has eyelashes. Yeah, so that was my next question, is, since you're a mixed media artist, I'm sure we have people who are really curious, how, what, what sort of media do you use? So tell us what some of those things that you incorporated in both the box and your face on a board. So this one is started off as a painting that I was just going to try and make look 3D, but then I saw my bottle of latex. I was like, let's just, let's do this one. And then I spent way too much time creating this. 
Um, all the, like, 3D bits, like, her nose is literally just cotton balls, essentially, that I soaked in liquid latex and built up slowly. Same with the lips and her eyes and, like, all the edges. Uh, and then, like, the blood is literally a mixture of liquid latex and uh, food coloring to get it to the correct bloody color. Um, there is, like, hair from wigs. And there's like embroidery there to stitch it all together. I don't know if you can, how well you can see them, but. So you but, stitched like while it was still wet? Okay. Yeah. So while, while it was wet, I like very, very carefully put all the stitching in and then like let it dry. And then I added a second layer over them to make sure they stayed and looked like they were coming through the skin. Yeah. That was tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Mimic is literally just popsicle sticks and way too much hot glue. Like, I think I went through 500 sticks of hot glue to create this. Holy cow. That's more than I've used in my whole life. Right? Like, I, I always make the joke that if hot glue wants to sponsor me, I'd be set. Because <laughs> I use it way too much. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And then what else? So you just did hot glue and you painted over it and stuck in eyeballs and teeth? Yeah, so I made all the like compartments and everything out of like the popsicle sticks and then I do a uh, base coat uh, to kind of in case I can't get everything on, on the top. Um, then I do all the hot glue, then I paint it again and the teeth are just like wood, like little wood dowels. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Before we move along here in just a minute, I do want the audience to get involved in something. If you can hold up, Nixali, if you can hold up your face on a board thing. So we call it a face on a board because it has no name. So a little game here for everyone. If you were to give this a name, what would you call it? Throw your answers in the comments section. And while those are coming in, I will have our co-host Agnesa read a few things from the comments for you. Amy said, this is so effing cool. Can't wait to show my fiance the dice box. Heck yeah. Ashley says, I love that it's 3D. Somebody says it looks absolutely disgusting and I mean this in the best way possible. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for that comment. <laughs> so I'm living with my mom currently and uh, when I got painting this, she's like, oh, that's so cool. And she put it like right where people, like when they walk in, they're, they're gonna see it, but like not immediately. So they have to do a double take and I, I love her for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So for those of you who just joined, we're naming this piece. And Agnesa, our co-host, we'll start reading some of the name suggestions for you now. You don't have to choose any of them, it's just ideas for fun. Right. Lady in the Pavement. Medusa's Death Mask. Our Lady Death. Oh, this is interesting. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Polina? Uh, rough Portuguese for little skin or skin cutie. Rissa, would you like to give us the pronunciation for that? It, it's Belinha. Belinha? Yeah, so it's like that. It's kind of like the N with a little squiggle over it in Spanish. The NH is oh, pronounced yeah. the same. Yeah. So it's like, like little Belinha. skin. Cool. Belinha. Hola, Belinha. Kind of like that. <laughs> That's, that actually sounds cute, but when you know the translation, you're like, uh. Right. Yeah, you're like, skin cutie, what? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that actually a word in Portuguese and why? <laughs> well, pele means skin, and when you add inya on the end, it makes it like either cute or like small. Okay. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Perfect. Interesting. <laughs> Zero percent body fat. <laughs> Zero percent? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was Nixalia with her mixed media art for us. Again, she will be back in a future show. Um, next show on October 15th, she will show us her bloody, gory, body part full guitar that she made. And then she'll be back as a drag king in the future and all kinds of other things. Some of us, you'll see some of our artists return in future shows later on. That's kind of the fun part of it is you get a little fan base here and then people want to come back to see you. All right, thank you so much, Nixalia. We're going to move on now to the very next person in our show, and that is somebody who already went earlier. If you were here for the beginning when Ashley Lanuza read two pieces of her poetry, and she's 
going to be back with a few other longer poems for us, after which we will have a writing prompt. But let me pull up that file for you, Ashley, and are you ready to read your next few poems? Yep. Here it is. I just want to say thank you for all the artists that shared um, in between. Um, they're really amazing and really inspiring, and thank you so much for sharing tonight. Cool. So, thank you for being here too, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> As I see, I've, I've rested from my, from my work day. But, um, okay, I will start. So this one's called Sophomore Year, and going back to kind of like the theme of the writing prompt about finding yourself in a strange place or just finding where you feel comfort. Sophomore year. Another time in another room for another party. Gone are the smells of crispy lumpia or the lingering aroma of pancit. Instead, neon lights flood the dark banquet hall. Blaring music eliminates any hope for conversation. She wears a large gown and a tiara around the crown of her perfectly coiled hair. Her youthful eyes are masked with tri-colored shadow. Fifteen covers the walls and her oversized portrait consumes the corner. A velvet three-tiered cake threatens to topple, casting a shadow over the tortillas, peppers, and onions and tomatoes. In the gleam of the metal serving spoon, hanging precariously over a plate of steaming orange stained rice, I catch my reflection, caramel skin, almond eyes, five feet upright. Then I open my mouth across the deafening cumbia. The abuela raises a brow, the tia opens his mouth, and the madre says, you speak Spanish? I apologize for my broken grammar, explain that I learned Spanish for familia. Their smile sweeten like pan dulce. Here's some more food, mija. So would you like to explain that one a little bit? Yeah, so um, I'm a quinceanera, which is like, I went to so many my second year of high school. And I always think about how I've been to like three or five quinceaneras and I've only been to one debut and that was mine, which is a Filipino tradition. When, you're when you turn 18 and you have a large party, it's like you're coming of age, right? And that's what also quinceanera is, but when you're 15. And so I think about like, how when I met other people who have been to more debuts than I have and I was like oh I've only been to my own but I've been to so many quinceaneras and I think about how at home I feel like this experience of like I look this certain way um and I'm definitely I'm not Latina at all but it's also like this was a place of comfort and home regardless of not being what I look like or how I am perceived to be yeah I love that. I love the line where, especially the expression you had on your face when you're like, you speak Spanish? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got that a lot too. <laughs> so, yeah. That's interesting. Okay, so yeah. next poem? Yes, next poem, please. So this is in commemoration of Filipino American History Month that starts tomorrow for the rest of the month of October. And one of the, the key parts about my book, about like the surge of identity is understanding history a, apart from my own history. And so I learned a lot about Filipino American history when I was in, in university, things that I never learned in, in ever in my life, um, not from my family, not from my school, um, but I learned there with the community that I shared with that is here today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, <laughs> and so I take this entire, like, like not the entire history, but parts of this history into my perspective. And kind of, I am that person in that history of time. So this is one of the three poems that all go together. And it's placed in the 1920s in, Del in, in Stockton, California, um, in the, from the first Filipino labor migrants uh, that were working the farm fields there. So this is called The Good. Music blasts from the sharply tuned band and I throw a week's earnings to greedy fingers and I grab this woman's smooth fingers into my callous palms. Her skin is milky white to my caramel brown and I hold her tall stature and caress her blonde hair and I look into her blue eyes trying to find myself and I cannot find me. This is all I have for romance. Uh, this poem, again, it, it goes back to uh, the taxi dance halls where um, labor workers would spend their money, their hard earned pennies from the field and just to dance for entertainment, um, just to dance with um, like the white women that were there because not a lot of like Asian women migrated from their home countries. And so the pennies that they did make, you know, you wanna relax, you wanna have a fun time with your friends. So they would go to these taxi dance halls. And that was kind of that scene I was trying to evoke, this emotion I was trying to evoke where it was like, 
I'm there, like being in that place, being in that image and not absolutely finding it for love reasons all the time, but looking for just a good time. Yeah. The way you read that, I got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to move down to the next one. As you can see, it all kind of connects title wise. It's like the good, the bad, and then there's a third one. Mm -hmm. So the bad. And I step into the crisp air of midnight and knuckles grab the lapel of my suit and my fingers slip from the door and my head pounds on the black cement and I hold my breath. And their masculine bodies pounce on me like lions attacking prey and their milky white bodies kick mine until my caramel skin paints the pavement red and the crunch of my bones, the slaps on my skin break me like the pieces of my already fractured spirit. Go back to where you came from blend with the sound of cracking cartilage and I scream in silence because no one wants to hear me. Wow. So this is in uh, kind of like after the events of the good um, where the character uh, that I'm trying to be in the, in the mind of uh, goes out and he's being beaten by uh, white men who are not happy with a, a brown man dancing with a white woman, which is very factual, which is very true to happen around that time where um, interracial relationships were just definitely frowned upon. And so, you know, you have this moment where the character that I'm perceiving, he's having all of this imagery, all of this, um, this detail in his experience dancing with a woman, and then now he's having all this experience in this detail being beaten up almost to death with blood on the pavement and all. So I really wanted to emulate like the, the plus sides of, of those days um, and, and also those really painful, disheartening parts uh, of reality where people were being beaten mm -hmm. just for dancing with another person that was like out of their <laughs> interracial group, which is awful, so. Yeah, wow. And the last one's called The American Dream. El Dorado Street is not lined with golden opportunity or the dream I chased. This world beat me to a pulp, slashed my wrists and buckled my knees, disbanded me from my brothers, raped me of my innocence, forced me into bed with blood, lust, fear, and shame. The blue and red lights threatened me, the suspect of my own undoing. Imprisonment for simply existing, trapped by an illusion that America is in the heart, when the truth is, pain is in the being. So this poem kind of just concludes those last two poems. Yeah, again, it's like a three part. And just the general experience of many of these farm workers that they had to go through um, where, you know, they were trying to look for that American dream when they moved from the Philippines and could barely find it. And a lot of this, of this portion of the book or these three poems are especially inspired by a book called America's in the Heart by Carlos Bulasan, which was written in the 40s. <laughs> and um, he actually talks about his experience of moving from the Philippines to Stockton, California and around that time period and seeing um, a lot of the like gambling dens and like um, alcoholism and whatnot because people are unable to access the equal opportunity that they were uh, disillusioned to believe in. So yeah, that's uh, Philippine American History Month, and it's a lot of pain. It's a lot of things that I had to learn. I was, like, learning to process, like, learning about it only four years ago, and so I put them in that poem because I think it's really important to add it to the narrative of American history because it is American history at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. And I actually, when I was, when I first read your book, when you were working on it, I, again, like I mentioned before, uh, during the very first workshop that you were on, I had no idea about a lot of this. It's not something that we're educated about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't even, they don't even like to talk about we, what we do in our own countries, you know, like here in Canada, it's the same way. They kind of sweep it under the carpet and hope mm -hmm. no one brings it up. You know, we're here, we have residential schools and, and things like that. Yeah. It's similar in the U.S. as well. So I'm going to have Ashley actually pull up one poem and read it from her book. If you, if you don't have the page ready, do you need a moment to find it? I have a page. Oh, so. perfect. Okay, so there's one more poem that she will read from her actual book, which by the way, feel free to hold up your book and show it to everybody briefly. Mm -hmm. There it is, My Heart of Rice mm -hmm. by Ashley Lanuza. Thank you. The rice book. Thank you, thank you. So this one. Ashley, sorry, one sec. Ashley's going to read this poem and then at the very end of it, pay attention to the very last line because that is going to, in a way, lead to into our writing prompt. 
So this poem doesn't actually have a title. It's technically an introduction to a chapter, <clears throat> but the chapter is called Longing for Belonging. These teenagers look like me, speak like me, and have smelled the raw fish laid on ice chips. Then why am I awkward? Sinigang, am I right? I joke, silence. Yet there is warmth around a culture I was not born into, but rooted through because of friends in school hallways and a distant family not bound by blood. You wanna add a little bit to that before we go right into the writing prompt? Sure. Yeah, so um, like I spoke about, um, a lot of my experience, I didn't have, a, I didn't grow up with a, with a large Filipino American community as a lot of my other peers have. And when I entered university and I willingly surrounded myself with Filipino American peers, just to understand my culture more and like my community more in the present day, not just from my family that just migrated a few decades ago, uh, I felt a bit off because I didn't feel like I had the same experiences as everyone did. It took a lot of digging and it took a lot of time to like finally feel that connection. And when I found that connection, it's been really great, but it, that, that initial uh, meeting was like a bit hard for me and a bit awkward for me to kind of meld myself into and just trying to revert back into my safe space, a comfortable space that I knew where I was. So, and it introduces the rest of the chapter, which, which talks about that discomfort and that awkwardness. Yeah. Awesome. So our co-host Agnesa shared information about Ashley's book and her website. Uh, you. If you're interested in reading any more of her writing and her book is on Amazon. And that very last line, could you read that one last time? Yes, I can. Um, and a distant family not bound by blood. Yeah. So when I read that line, when I was trying to think of a writing prompt for us all to work on, a short little one that's going to last five minutes, uh, I thought of a distant family not bound by blood. And I thought of the times when we felt like somebody was family when, you know, really they weren't. When you, when you meet somebody and you just click and you're like, this person's closer to me than anybody I grew up with. And I also thought about times when you feel at home in a place that you've never been to before and you have no connection to, you know, not like your great granddaddy used to live here. Instead, you just show up to this foreign place and you're like, why does my heart feel at home? This is awesome. Yeah. Weird. So I'm a traveler like many of us are. And those are some of the feelings I've experienced while traveling. And so I decided to have our writing prompt to be about that. And I'm going to have, for five minutes, I'm going to have you write in any format you choose, in poem, song, paragraph, sentence, that whatever comes to you, don't feel pressured by, you know, any, sticking to any kind of specific structure. Write about a time when you felt closer than family with a person who was just recently a stranger or at home in a place that wasn't home. And again, you have five minutes. And what we're going to play for music during this writing prompt is a song that is an instrumental piece called Cliffs by Luis Fernando Robles, our musician from earlier. Luis from Mexico writing a song about the cliffs of Mohair in Ireland. So it's him making music about a place that's not home, but felt like home. So go ahead and start writing. You have five minutes. I'll play the song about two times.
was the end of the writing prompt. Feel free to send in the comments. I already see some things coming in, which is awesome. Feel free to, if you haven't yet, feel free to send in more of your poetry into the comments and we're going to select some of them to read aloud if you're comfortable with that. Let me see what was the first one that came in. Mars, would you like me to read yours aloud or would you like to read yours aloud yourself? Or Marcy, is it? Um, <laughs> probably it's better if you read it. I don't feel that comfortable speaking in English since yes. it's been <laughs> full long. That's fine. Oh, is that Luis's girlfriend? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's sweet. laughs> How cute. Thank you for participating. Oh, yeah. wow. here and I, hi, Louise's girlfriend. I even got like red cheeks and everything just oh. thinking of reading out loud. No, no, no. <laughs> That's okay. That's what I'm here for. I read aloud for anybody who um, doesn't really want to. That's absolutely fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for participating and for sharing a poem with us. I'm going to read yours for you. And, unless you're not comfortable with me reading it aloud. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Apart as we are, after spending so many days, so many months, so many things, I just can't help but wonder when or how will my heart be complete again, at home with family, by blood. Uh, what is that? Odor Zuhasi? <laughs> what is that? He's German. Oh, Odor, Odor that. Zuhasi. Does that mean home in German? Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Odor Zuhasi. Totally got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> Other Zuhazi with you as you grow up from an au pair. Oh, okay, so that's from an au pair perspective. You've been an au pair? Yeah, exactly. I was au pair in Germany for a year. And the baby I, I saw growing up was 10 months when I got there. And now she's eight. And I can't believe it. Like, I think she's already uh, taller than me because I'm pretty small. <laughs> I'm um, like one meter and a half. I don't know how much that is in like feet and stuff, but like that's not Four much. Foot, yeah. <laughs> and they are so tall and I, I don't know, I just miss her so much. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Um, by the way, feel free if you have anything that you would want me to read anonymously, free to, to send some of those to me anonymously as well. You have, a, you have a, a, the ability to send something privately to me if you select the blue button that has the word everyone on it and instead choose a person by name. So I'm Alina Oliferowski, the host. If you click on the name Alina, you can send me a poem privately and I will read it anonymously without disclosing who wrote it. This is an anonymous piece of writing that was sent to me during the workshop. I saw it a little bit too late to read it during the actual live workshop, but I obtained permission to read it anonymously in a recording afterwards to include it in the recording of the workshop. As a woman today, a partner, and a mother. Our home has become home. Our family has become my home. But I choke back tears and breathe heavily as I think of the child hurried within me who never found home. I thought that was a powerful one. So very next one we have is from Amy. Okay, I'll read yours aloud for you. Pavement cracks that have never seen my boot soles often fit them better than the ones that wore them in. Interesting. Thank you for sharing, both of you. Uh, we have one from Pat. Is that you, Patrick? Yeah. You know? Would you like to read yours yourself or have me read it? Uh, it's, um, maybe you read it. <laughs> okay. Dancing figures, shadows in lights, whirring energy spontaneity in the night, feel the strangers coursing energy found at last, lost family community homing hope to creativity you're alone but you are with me merging wavelengths music is electric harmony sorry if i butchered reading that a little bit <laughs> i don't know what i was thinking but yeah. <laughs> no i love it. It, make, it it definitely makes me feel like it's something you would feel when you're surrounded by a whole bunch of strangers like at a festival and you being a festival yeah, so. it makes sense where your brain went <laughs> Then we have one from Ashley, and I believe you'd like to read your own, Ashley, right? Since you're our spoken word poet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, jumping off the bus on top of the hill, ocean peeking at me like on the streets of Santa Monica. Colorful walls and slanted roofs, crystal blue water and warm air and crisp breezes. Belém, Lisboa, Portugal, swallow me whole, one day be my home. 
Ooh, I like that one. I miss it so much. <laughs> it's been a year since I was sad. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. coronavirus, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a successful poem when you react to it like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For all the memories, like it floods. Right. <laughs> I uh, started writing mine during the very last minute, and so it's very short, and um, there's not much to it, but I'll go ahead and read it too. What is home but a place where our hearts sings while our mouths are shut? A place where the strangers smile like our own mothers do, and where the lush green and flowers grow in colors more radiant. <laughs> You've done this before. Um, we have one more. <laughs> yeah, I have. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm a poet, and I read my poetry for previous yeah. workshops. Um, uh, we have one more from Kay Williams, and um, Kay says that it's a wee bit long, but would you like to read it aloud to us anyways? Do it, do it. <laughs> this is my best friend. <laughs> my poem's actually about her, so. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay, are you figuring out your audio stuff? Um, I'll let you figure that out, and I think there's one more from like Sally, all right? Hey, Sally, would you like to read your own? Sure. Just go? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't and read a lot. And we're live. <laughs> Shit. Uh, haunting set the meeting, a stare down set the curiosity. Vanilla macarons open conversation. They took zombie Skittles as their prize. Mutual respect from friendship. They are my liberty cap, and I am their ink cap. My personal Florida Keys. That's me. Yeah, it's my best friend. <laughs> oh, you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I was going to tell you, you wrote one about Kay, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was about to say, you might need to explain yours, and I wasn't sure who said the it's my best friend part. So, yeah, um, that's, hey, that's, that's my best friend, and we, like, we came up with mushroom nicknames for each other, so she's my liberty cap, and I'm her ink cap, so... <laughs> By the way, everyone, <laughs> Nick Salia will be back as well with some of her little mushroom sculptures in the future. Yes. yes. Her creepy mushroom sculptures. Again, she's uh, the master of creepy, so you should expect that by now. <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, oh, I got it pulled up. All right, so came up with this on the fly. Sweat beating across my brow as the sound of tin canteens and polyester straps rattled against asphalt. The sun boring down through my helmet and tapping my skull reminded me of the days and afternoons and nights and overnights and dawns and days again of men screaming spittle into my eyes. What you looking at, private? Oh, you think we're friends, private? Look around you. You see all them? You think they're your friends, private? They weren't. None of them were. My eyes stings, my feet begin to blister. I trip and fall, the clatter of my gear cascading over me, more yelling, like always, only to be rolled over, blinded by the unforgiving star trying to kill me. A shadow grows over me, a dark silhouette shaped like me. Come on, sis, 10 miles down, 10 more to go. I got you. None of them were my friends. They were my family of a different cloth. Never blood, but deeper. Always and forever. Wow. Yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> that just came out of you in the five or six minutes <laughs> that we just had? Yeah. Yep. Interesting. I love how your, where your brain went with that. That's not what I expected at all. <laughs> you all think outside of norms when it comes to certain things. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. You're welcome. And small explanation, I'm sure as after hearing that, um, I am part of the military. So that's where that came from, actually, uh, in basic training, where it was every day and every night and every hour on the hour that we kind of were getting a little uh, uh, effed up. <laughs> that sounds cool. But we really did uh, build a heavy bond of brothers and sisters that were not blood. So when you thought of home, you thought of the military? Yes, ma'am. Interesting. Okay. Well, I guess, you know, we all think of different things. And I guess for me, it's, you know, traveling abroad.
for you it's the military for other for Nixalia was friendship I love it um okay well that's it for our impromptu poetry which by the way I like how you said I wrote this on the fly we all did <laughs> you're not supposed to prepare for this prompt nobody knows it ahead of time <laughs> But um, that's really the conclusion of the show. I'm just going to thank everybody really quick before we end and let you all know that it is so special that you're here. As always, we ran over our time. <laughs> I, I have not been able to figure out a way to not do that yet. But thank you so much for sticking around till the very end. For those of you who are here, those of you who had to go and we'll catch up on the recording, that's fine too. But again, thank you for the wonderful, beautiful, engaged audience that attended this show. Thank you to my featured guests for being here to share something with the audience because one wouldn't work without the other. And I would love to see you all back for a future show. The next one is on October 15th. And audience members, if you decide to, that you'd like to be featured or you know somebody who would, then definitely get in touch. There's an email address I'm sharing right now on the screen. It's virtualcreativeworkshop at gmail.com. Send people to this email address. I'm going to soon have a website too. If you know of anybody else who'd like to be featured or if you want to be featured, that's great too. Again, thanks everyone. Thank you so much and see you all next time. Bye. Right. Oh, and by the way, Luis is going to play us a little closing song as we all scroll through the comments section, get some of the contact info for some of our favorite artists. So you're welcome to stick around to the very end of that. When you have to go, go ahead and go. But again, I love you all. Thank you so much for coming. Bye. Bye. You call and I rise While as the wind which rose across the moon All we need is watch each other Like the eagle we will soar You are the goal, I am the answer You are the wish and I am the way You the music, I the dancer you are the night and I am the day. You are the night and I am the day. <laughs> bye bye, guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ah. I'm trying to like write something. I'm sorry. Okay. I leave this on until everybody's gone. <laughs> cool. Taking down some contact info. Oh no, I was writing down the uh, uh, Pelinia name because oh. I think it's like really awesome. Is that the name that wins? Yeah, I like it a lot. Because it's definitely like, it's creepy, but it's cute. Yeah, I love it too. That's really good. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you guys. You. Bye. Awesome. Nice to meet you all. Cool. Dude, I, got, I got so much love in the comments. I just feel like overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.